Okay, so good good morning and good evening to everyone. Again, I am Aris Obando. I'll I will be your moderator for for this uh, lecture. Uh, and to uh, first a short prayer. Let me share my screen. Let me be the change I want to see To do with strength and wisdom All that needs to be done And become the more Thank you, Kathleen, for the prayer. To initially start uh, the lecture series, uh, may I call on Dr. Ray Montan, the Vice President for Research and Innovation of De La Salle University, uh, to initially introduce the, the uh, uh, sustainability lecture series. Raymond. Uh, thank you, Aris. Uh, thank you, colleagues from different parts of the world who are joining us today. Uh, please give me a few minutes to just explain how this lecture series came about. So I'll begin by sharing my screen. So once again, this is part of the 2022 Sustainability Lecture Series, which is organized jointly by the International Association of La Salle Universities and the La Salle University. This is an initiative which dates back to 2019 when we were, uh, by we I mean, Chancellor Emeritus, Dr. Carmelita Quebenco, who also represents the LSU in the IALU Research Committee. My colleagues, uh, Dr. Kathleen Aviso, who is currently the Dean of the Gokongwe College of Engineering. My colleague, Dr. Alvin Kolaba, who is currently Director of the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research. And myself, 
at the time we were thinking of a way to begin to bring together the IALU network to work towards the common goal of sustainable development. Obviously the plans were interrupted in 2020 by the COVID-19 pandemic, but we also thought that we should make the best of the situation. And as a result, after some months of planning, in 2021, we launched this lecture series. Now, De La Salle University, which is located in the heart of Manila, the capital of the Philippines, is a university which has made a firm commitment, uh, number one, towards expanding our mission to include scientific and scholarly research. And uh, since 2015, through the insertion of the phrase attuned to a sustainable earth in our mission vision, uh, we put a firmer commitment in focusing a lot of our efforts towards uh, sustainable development, not just in the Philippines, but in fact, throughout the region and uh, throughout the entire world. So please visit our website if you would like to learn more. But this initiative, of course, is done in cooperation with a global network of uh, sister institutions located in North and South America, Africa, Europe, uh, the Middle East, and, um, and parts of Eastern Asia. And because of the geographic, cultural, and language barriers, there have been challenges in bringing the network together towards a, a common pursuit. But we thought that sustainability being a planetary mission and planetary goal is common to all of us and transcends these uh, boundaries. And the growth of this lecture series, I'm happy to note, has actually shown that there is a firm commitment that we can bring together via a common platform and with the aid of modern technology. The lecture series is inspired by two landmark documents that were released for public consumption in the middle of the previous decade. Number one, and geared towards the Catholic world, is Pope Francis's Laudato Si encyclical. When this was released, there was a call for re-examining modern lifestyles vis-a-vis -vis the constraints that natural processes in the planet places on uh, lifestyles that we would like to aspire for. And this is very critical, partly because obviously as many countries throughout the world develop, there's an aspiration towards lifestyles which may actually not be sustainable uh, if we were to do it for all seven or eight billion inhabitants of this planet. But it's also significant because of the link to Catholicism and because of the way cultural and religious beliefs drive actual behavior of people. I think this is going to be highly influential for a large proportion of the world's population. Now, the second influential document or uh, landmark uh, foundation is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, 17 goals that outline or that map different areas for us to achieve sustainability, ranging from poverty alleviation to food security, climate security, and uh, partnership to achieve such goals. And again, for the secular world, and in fact, for the entire world, these uh, 17 sustainable development goals also provide a very effective scorecard to develop national policies. Likewise, for institutions to adopt them at the level, at their own levels, and to gear education, research, and social engagement towards contributing to these goals. So with these landmark documents, we then thought that it would be a good idea to bring together the international community of Lasallian institutions towards this common goal and share our activities, our insights, our expertise with the rest of the group. But at the same time, we thought that this should definitely go beyond the Lasallian family. And hence, uh, we opened the lecture series to like-minded partners and audiences throughout the entire world. So let me just briefly uh, conclude this uh, very brief talk by saying that we've held for most of the past two years, lectures typically on the last Wednesday of each month, but we've been able to make adjustments depending on 
time zone issues or availability of speakers. The lectures are streamed live via Zoom, but at the same time, recordings are made available via YouTube. So anyone who's just joining us today can actually visit our YouTube channel and look at the various previous editions of the lecture. We deal with diverse topics related to sustainable development. And again, this is very broad and not just purely environmental issues, but they include economic and social issues as well. We've explored alternative formats. Uh, the default is that we have an expert speaker, but we've had panel discussions, uh, talk show style. We've also successfully expanded the scope of the lecture series, as well as not just geographic scope, but again, with the help of uh, expert translators and machine translation, we've been able to deliver some of the recent lectures in Spanish and of course, future lectures might be delivered in French, in Chinese, and definitely we should be, we should be able to make this very inclusive just uh, by using what resources are available to us. Our resource persons are primarily from the IALU network, but we've had, of course, uh, co-speakers, uh, which were invited via the professional networks of our uh, pool of contributors. Now, finally, I would be remiss to say, but if uh, I was not to mention that this lecture series has been hosted steadily by our Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research. And I thank my colleagues for the hard work in sustaining this and uh, certainly look forward to sustaining this further in the future. Thank you and good day. I hope you find today's lecture stimulating and inspiring. Thank you, Raymond, for introducing the uh, sustainability lecture series. Uh, and uh, of course, to initially start uh, the lecture, uh, we would like to first uh, call on uh, Ms. Patricia uh, Kaiser Vargas Mangan to initially introduce uh, La Salle University Brazil. Patricia? Thank you very much. Um, hello, dear La Salle and colleagues. Good morning, good evening. I'm so glad to be here today. I'm honored to be able to represent La Salle Canoas and send greetings from our rector, Brother Paulo, and our Victor, vice rector, Brother Cledges. And I'm so happy to be actually physically near to our lecture in our campus in Canoas in the south of Brazil after those so challenging pandemic times. So as I said, uh, we are in the south of Brazil and Christian brothers arrived in Brazil more than a hundred years ago to teach children and young adults. And 46 years ago, Unila Sali was born, a university strongly connected to our community. And research has been, has been part of our practices especially in the last two decades. And uh, so nowadays, one of our duties as La Salle community is to do practical, impactful research and also to advise, to teach master and PhD students. And Professor Fabricio is one of our professors. So yes, I'm here um, also, and especially to thank, thank you, Professor Fabricio Pontin, uh, to be here today, uh, preparing this special moment to share with us. Uh, and he is part of one of our uh, programs, the program of education. And I hope you, that everybody interact with us. We are really glad to be here. And I, I want to thank you to all uh, our yellow friends and seeing some uh, really good friends here uh, in these small boxes here. I, I see in, especially Carmelita, I'm so glad to see you tonight here. And so uh, to our dear friends from Philippines that made this moment possible, thank you again. Thank you very much, Patricia, for that uh, welcoming remarks. Let me now share my screen. All right, so uh, 
Today, we would have uh, the lecture entitled Education for Sustainability, Fundamental Capabilities, and Autonomy. And this would be delivered by uh, Professor Fabricio Pontin, a uh, professor graduate program in education, La Salle University in Canaos, Brazil. Just to introduce the webinar, uh, what do effective practices of sustainability require? So Professor Pontin will attempt to provide a framework for effective sustainability measures, focusing on the importance of education in promoting capabilities and autonomy. Professor Pontin's hypothesis is that the focal point on sustainability requires the promotion of capabilities program in education following NASBOM 1993 and 2007. He will first define the core values of the capabilities approach, further detailing how such an approach towards sustainability looks like for, from a pedagogic standpoint. In short, he will attempt to show the effective sustainability measures must be context dependent and require the integral development of autonomy. Such development is direct connected to the promotion of fundamental and alienable capabilities. Now to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Fabricio Pontin is a professor in the graduate program in education at La Salle University, Canaos, Brazil. He received his PhD in philosophy <clears throat> at the Southern Illinois University. And he is a researcher at the Amartya Sen Research Groups and at the Phenomenology Research Center. Without further ado, let us all welcome Professor Fabricio Ponti. Well, Professor Arias, thank you so much for your kind introduction. I hope that you can hear me well. I hope that I'm that the transmission is do, is going flawlessly. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, Professor Aris, for your very kind introduction. Thank you so much, Professor Raymond Tan, for all your work in organizing this conference. Thank you so much, Professor Kathleen Aviso, for your wonderful and kind and prompt invitation uh, so that we can join in and really connect the dots in this international and important community of La Salle and universities throughout the world. I'm really proud to be part of this and I'm really proud to call Professor Patricia my colleague. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you today and to share a little bit of what I think that is a very important issue and it's an issue that those of us that are situated in the what what you could call the global south and i know that this is a loaded term right i know that not everybody likes this term so i'm using it and please try to get it with a grain of salt uh but we have a special concern about this because we contain most of what is of interest of being sustained uh, if you understand what I mean. Uh, by that, I mean that most of the green areas and areas of um, development and potential exploration for a green future are actually located in countries like the Philippines and Brazil. Uh, so the Global South contains much of the space that needs protection and is at the same time in a very vulnerable place in terms of being a uh, the center of different kinds of interests that seek to explore these areas in an unsustainable way, or maybe to explore it in ways that will uh, kind of interfere with the sovereignty of our country. So I think that the main question here and the question that I want to address is what does sustainability require? And this comes from a very specific point of view here. Usually when we talk about sustainability, and I want to um, highlight something that Professor Raymond Tan already highlighted, which is that both the development goals at the UN and Laudato Si have introduced a different approach here that I think is worth taking, that it's not enough to talk about the normative part. That is, it's not enough 
to talk about compliance and environmental compliance. It's not enough to ask companies what they are doing to comply with environmental regulations, for example. Of course, we all want companies to comply with environmental regulations. We don't want you know, uh, to just throw the baby with the bathwater. That's not what I am suggesting at all. But what I am suggesting is that this is not enough for sustainability to be effective. I'll bring some examples here that I think some of you will be able to connect with. And I want to begin with a very poignant example from Southern Brazil. Okay, so Southern Brazil has a very specific bioma, a very specific environmental uh, um, uh, environmental situation, which we call the Pampa. Uh, the Pampa is a protected area here in Southern Brazil, um, Argentina and Uruguay, it, it's huge. And it's very threatened by agricultural expansion. Uh, the most difficult part of this expansion is what's connected with soy, soy production and eucalyptus production in the southern part of Brazil and northern part of Uruguay. And the question is, how do we fight this? How do we sustain the Pampa region? This is a very difficult question. And it's a very difficult question because it requires us to ask, how can we effectively ask of individuals that have interests in this area not to give up on their interests because of capital pressure? That is, you have very powerful lobby groups connected to the production of soil and eucalyptus that have a direct interest in these areas that are environmental protection areas and that are working within the governments to, let's say, make light of the current protections or to relativize current protections. How do we fight this? How do we sustain a, a point in which, for example, we can give incentives to people so that they won't sell their pieces of land or start producing in their pieces of land uh, crops that are not sustainable. In, in my example, these crops are soy and eucalyptus, but there are many other similar examples all over the world. Small land production has a very hard time sustaining its style and sustaining its sustainability from an environmental perspective when it's pressured from the outside. How can we effectively deal with this issue? That is, in a way that won't alienate small producers, that won't turn producers against environmental protections, for example. This is a very common denominator here, especially from uh, in, in a political from a political standpoint. We're currently in a situation where we are having the governmental state elections running in Southern Brazil. And, and a very important focal point of the current election is that environmental protections regarding sustainability are a burden for small producers. So they're honorating small producers. They're honorating people that own small plots of land. They are a problem for people that produce in these lands. Okay, so how do we deal with that? First question is, is it fair of us to ask of small producers to adapt in ways that will increase their poverty and decrease their conditions of life so they carry the burden of sustainability? So this is an important question, and I hope that by the end of my talk, I will be able to give some insights of how I think we can work with that from a standpoint that works both in the institutional level and also from an educational perspective. I think we need both. Only one of these won't be enough. And it, it's also not going to be enough to focus on this from the standpoint of compliance, because I think that compliance is a very problematic issue here. Um, we're talking about compliance as a solution for sustainability from a legal standpoint. But I agree with uh, Pope Francis and I agree with the UN sustainability um, approach when it says that we need more. And I think that what we actually need is a promotion of actual autonomy and actual sustainability. And I think that we have a framework for that. 
and I want to focus on three outers. I, I focused on my abstract on sand and loose ball, but I want to add another one. I want to add a Brazilian outer. I want to add a Freirian from Paulo Freire perspective to this issue. So how does that look and how can it help us understand sustainability? So first of all, the first question is, what do we need to protect? So this is a very important question and um, a classic perspective on that. Uh, requires uh, or will suggest four main questions that need to be answered in order for us to understand what is sustainability. First of all, what to sustain? Why should it be sustained? Who is concerned? And in what respect is sustainability allowed? So first of all, what, what to sustain? We need to sustain any kind of natural capital which is in danger of being irreversibly lost and whose loss would impact some kind of environment in ways that are really harmful. So we need to avoid harm. And this brings the question, who is being protected? One of the worst things that we can do when we talk about sustainability is to think of sustainability only from an anthropocentric point of view. There are many environments that are worth protecting, not because of the harm that they create when they are destroyed for humans, but the harm that they create to other species. The Pampa is a good example here. The end of Pampa would bring terrible harm for human beings, but it would bring even more terrible harm for many species that would go extinct or that would have no way of sustaining their quality of life without this kind of bioma. So this is an important question. We need to focus on why we should protect and who we are protecting. Because when we frame who is being protected, we also need to understand who we need to involve. Any kind of sustainability measure that does not take in consideration the parts that are being impacted when they are being protected is doomed to fail, even when it is successful. Now, this is a paradoxical situation and it happens and it has happened in many places where we have developed ways of sustaining certain environments, but we have not involved the ports in the policy that sustains such environments. A good example is the way that some environmental agencies impose from the top down policies on the populations that are affected. These policies involve costs and they will turn the local populations against regulators. And in that way, what happens is that in the end of the day, the autonomy of the individuals is affected. And in the long term, these sustainability measures are not sustainable because they will be reversed by political pressure. So uh, this has happened in Brazil. I'm sure that in the Philippines, you've seen uh, similar examples where you have very, very wonderful and elegant normative frameworks for sustainability being designed. They are designed from the top down and then they are imposed into the stockholders in the different locals without the involvement of such stockholders in the locals. This ultimately ends up being unsustainable. Ultimately, these projects, even if they are effective in protecting areas, are reversed by political lobby because the population does not understand what is happening or, or it feels uh, unfairly burdened by regulations. On the other hand, we need these regulations. So how do we deal with this paradox? I think that the the main issue here is involving the populations in the uh, in the process. Okay, this is really, really, really important here, and I want to try to focus on how that can be done. So, um, Amartya Sen has shown some of the consequences of applying a top-down perspective for any kind of economic program. And one of the things that happens when you do that is that the population does not understand what is happening and the conception of welfare that is being created within these scenarios does not uh, turn out to be anything sustainable in the long term. So this is a bit of a playful uh, joke that I'm doing on the term. How can sustainability be sustainable? 
it's no use to implement a normative that we cannot sustain in the long term, right? How do we how do we then can do that in ways that are not unfair? So first of all, we need to involve the local population. And this involvement of the local population requires a, co a connection and a building up of actual autonomy. And I think that the way to do that is that the state needs to be involved from institutional level in framing sustainability practices from the beginning. So for example, is starting with sustainability in the schools and teaching ways of understanding your environment, understanding how your actions impact directly on your environment, and then showing how individuals can really make a difference in the way that they're dealing with this. Uh, in Brazil, we have a very interesting program in that sense. We call it Projeto Tamar. Projeto, Ta Projeto Tamar is a groundbreaking project in terms of sustainability. And I think it integrates education in a really interesting way. So as you know, the Atlantic coast, or as you may know, the Atlantic coast is really dense in, tur in a turtle population, in turtles. And turtles have been historically uh, um, aimed uh, for hunting, uh, for their caskets. So they've always been very threatened by hunting, uh, by predatory practices. And the communities that had built themselves around hunting turtles developed a whole system inside this practice. So it was very difficult to get into this. Most of the turtle populations in the Brazilian Southern coast and the Brazilian Northeastern coast were near extinction by the end of the, 18, the 1980s. Projeto Tabar enters the scenario in this sense, how can we build a sustainable scenario for turtles in the Atlantic coast? And their first proposal is we need to involve the main stakeholders, meaning we need to involve the hunters. We need to turn the hunters into environmental agents. And this was a really, really difficult uh, system, but that they turned out to be successful because they used a system of involvement of the individuals in building up a whole network of preservation. What they did is that they showed these individuals that they could retain their communities, they could retain their practices, but they could turn their hunting practices into preservation practices. So individuals that had built entire networks <clears throat> in, in meaning networks, within hunting turtles were able to build a different kind of network in saving turtles. And in 30 years, the turtle population in the Atlantic coast of Brazil, the Brazilian Atlantic coast, went up sevenfold. So many of the turtles that were, were under threatened positions in the beginning of the 90s are now quite abundant on the coast. And the reason for this success was a pedagogical move. It involved the stakeholders into understanding that this practice was not harmful to them. It was actually quite beneficial to them that they could understand a change in their perspective from a predatory perspective into a sustainable perspective as something that could add up quality to their lives and add up quality to their lives in a multifaceted way. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that it's not enough in terms of um, if you want to offer a compensation for someone who is having to change their ways of doing the things that they're doing because of environmental legislation, because of environmental regulations, it's, no, it's not enough to give these individuals capital compensation. Monetary compensation is part of it, but monetary compensation is not enough. Many times what is at stake when people need to change their practices so they can introduce more environmental friendly and sustainable practices into their lives, this also means changing their community practices.
changing the way they, their communities work. So it's essential to work within the communities. So communities do not lose their points of inflection, their points of meetings, their, the points in which they introduce meaning in the way they have their social relations. So this is a pedagogical move. And this pedagogical move is deeply intersubjective. It requires that, uh, and I'm putting myself here in the place of, for example, a legislation or someone who is implementing policy. Policymakers need to enter a intersubjective relation with the stakeholders in the communities that are going to be affected by sustainability measures. Sustainability measures will, especially when they are meaningful, change the way communities work. In order for them to be effective, community cannot, communities cannot see sustainability measures as a burden. In, in the Rust Belt in the United States, we've seen this. Sustainability measures in the Rust Belt in the United States were seen as destructive of the way of life in the Rust Belt. Because the stakeholders in the Rust Belt were not involved in making the, the, the decisions and in the way that the decisions were going to have consequences for their lives, ultimately, this, this sustainability uh, measures were not sustainable. What we're seeing in the last eight years in the United States is the reversion of many environmental protection uh, regulations for iron, for mining, in West Virginia, uh, in Northern Pennsylvania, in all of these areas. And this happens ultimately because the, the communities did not see this, these sustainability measures as advantages. They did not understand why they were bringing to their lives. And let me remind you, in many of these cases, they were handsomely rewarded from a capital standpoint, that is, uh, their wealth did not necessarily change, but their communities did. And because their communities changed, their ways of life changed with it. And their qualities of life changed with it too. Now, if we take a look at Laudato Si, for example, one of the points that I, that I think are really valuable when we look at Laudato Si is the way that it integrates different measures in thinking sustainability through. When we integrate different measures, we'll see that autonomy is not only about capital freedom, that is freedom to spend money in the market. Again, this is an important freedom and I don't think we should get rid of it. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. But what I am saying is that in order for us to understand how effective these measures are going to be, we need to integrate other issues. And we need to see how effectively these other issues are being, are being connected. Sen has suggested that it's central to understand here the role of actual institutions in the state. That is, how the state is providing other basic services as it tries to implement sustainability measures. So if the state is implementing sustainability measures and require individuals to comply or to have their lives changed because of environmental regulations. And the only thing that it's offering is some kind of capital compensation without other community uh, protections, it's bound to go bad. It's bound to create paradoxical effects. So we need to integrate other issues. Sen himself uh, is quite vague about this. Uh, and this is the reason why I bring up Martin Nussbaum to the table, because I think that Martin Nussbaum will bring a more complex way of thinking what we need to actually provide to individuals in order to make this kind of policy happen. In a way, what we're talking about here is how do we make sustainability, uh, sustainability measures effective from a person-centric point of view? How do we make it centered on the person and not on the normative and capital advantages of sustainability? Because I think this was the big mistake of the 90s in terms of the way that we framed sustainability, the discourse on, on sustainability. The discourse on sustainability on the 90s was all about financial compensations. Enterprises would be handsomely 
compensated if they shown how they were doing sustainability measures. They, they would have advantages, right? Uh, the, the World Trade Organization would integrate you in a more effective way if you, if you were showing the way that you were doing this kind of measure. That, 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 that's the story of this kind of thing in the 90s. And I think that during the OS, we see this model falling to pieces because the communities are reacting against it. Local communities start to react against it when they are not properly connected to the way that these measures are being connected or being implemented. So this is the million dollar question. How do we solve this issue? Again, I think both Laudato Si and the new environmental policies within the UN are trying to address this. And I think that News Ball can start to give us a way to think this through, that I'll end with Freire, okay? So News Ball will connect this with four fundamental capabilities. That is, any kind of measure any kind of sustainability measure that wants to be effective needs to allow communities and individuals within these communities to think themselves in relation to these policies in ways that sustain. A conception of justice, a conception of goods and of values and values, a theory or a conception of interaction with norm, uh, uh, of interaction with nature, and criteria for constraints on ecology. Now, let me break this down. First of all, different communities will be differently impacted by regulations. We need to inform individuals of the ways that these impacts are going to happen. And individuals need to be protected in ways that they understand what's going to happen once they adopt environmental practices. Uh, I think that the big mistake is that we always frame environmental practices as, oh, this is going to be positive. You're going to protect the environment. You're going to protect the green areas. You're going to protect this territory. And of course, it is positive that people are doing this. Uh, evidently, it is positive, but it is only positive if you understand why it is positive. You need to understand the language that is being used. Otherwise, your connection to these regulations, your connection to why environmental protection is being implemented is not autonomous. You cannot understand yourself regarding that. You cannot appropriate this measure. So this is a, pro this is a pedagogical problem. In Porto Alegre, we have a historical connection here and a historical um, uh, policy connected to recycling, the way that recycling was implemented in Porto Alegre. One of, the one, of, one of the ways in which our recycling policy was really successful and during a long time it was an example for, for Brazil was because it had a deep connection with the communities. Communities were taught in ways that they could use elements that were being trashed, how they could incorporate waste in ways that were meaningful for their lives how they could incorporate waste and use it autonomously within their communities. This was central in building up a successful operation for waste management in Porto Alegre. But in the last 10 years, no, 10 years is too much, but in the last five years, we've seen a big step back in this. Why? Because there has been a deep association. We have stopped thinking with the communities and stop and started re-implementing a policy from top down. And in doing so, we alienate individuals and their conceptions of the good from the policy. So we need to inform individuals and then integrate them into the debate on sustainability. This is a pedagogical move. We can only do that in talking about and environmental protection, the environment, the climate, the areas that need protection and why they need protections, how to understand vulnerability in and beginning in our classes, our classrooms. The classroom is a central element here. 
we need to integrate, and we are integrating, I hope all of us, these this discussions in the classroom, but it's extremely necessary to integrate the vocabulary of env the environment protection inside the classroom, of climate change, of, uh, 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 of global ecology, how ecology works, why it is important to preserve, how preservation will have an impact in your life and how you will be able to use that for your own benefit in the future. This is not to say that individuals will only work with the environment because they are self-centered, but it's very hard to persuade individuals to retain their connection to environmental practices if they do not understand what's going on, even if they do not understand why they should be selfless regarding the environment. And I don't think anyone is really selfless regarding the environment, given that the consequences of climate change affect us all. But again, I must go back to the distinct, to, to a very pragmatic point, which is the case of eucalyptus and soy in Southern Brazil. You can tell a small, a, a small plot, a small land owner in Southern Brazil, that his option for eucalyptus will harm the environment. You can tell him that in the long term, it will really impact his way of life. You can tell him that in 20 years, his entire area will be starving. And then he will answer you, I am starving right now. I cannot sustain my way of life right now. My community is being harmed right now. So this is when it gets back to the importance of institutions in preserving conditions in which individuals make choices about the environment. Our choices about the environment are extremely context dependent, even when we are educated about it. So if we educate individuals about the environment and we don't change the material conditions in which individuals are making choices about the environment, maybe they will retain choices that are harmful. And maybe in the long term, even very well designed sustainability measures will not be sustainable because individuals will see them as harmful in the short term. And then survival takes hold. Even if in 15 years, this choice brings you very, very bad results because you have very, very bad results right now in front of you. So this is, an important point in, way, in which I think, and in this I am starting to move towards my conclusion, in which I think that a Freudian perspective is really important. I think that a Freudian perspective is really important because Paulo Freire, the legendary Brazilian pedagogue, uh, has shown us that it's, it's, it's impossible to think autonomy through without thinking the context in which autonomy is being visualized. That is, freedom is always conditioned to the context in which we choose. The way we relate, the way we preserve, the way we see the environment is deeply connected to, our, to the way that we are as we see the environment. The environment is dependent on our material conditions. The way we are going to interact, the way we see our surroundings, most of the Brazilian population lives in situations where sewer is not present. How do you connect this with the necessity of water, for example, in water preservation and reserve preservation? So water is really important, right? Yes, Pure, uh, and the preservation of our river basins is really important. Yes, it is. But we need to show individuals how their actions will impact this and how and why they should have them. And moreover, they need to understand why they're doing this. Otherwise they will detach themselves from these actions. And in the long term, they will not be sustainable. So there is a central role of education and of our role as educators for sustainability. And I think that the most central point here is what is for sale? That's why I, I, I use the word that is inalienable in the title of my conference. 
We need to, we need to conceive of certain conditions of choice as inalienable. But the problem here is how do we protect them? Again, we will need actual institutions protecting individuals from, for example, the autonomy of selling their own water, the autonomy of selling their own future. It's very difficult to do this. This is much easier said than done. But uh, uh, if we don't conceive of certain capabilities, of certain conditions of choice as inalienable, then we will conceive of the environment itself as up for grabs. And again, we will need institutions to do that. So what I am looking here is at a double-faced perspective. On the one hand, what I am defending is that we actually need a conception of sustainability that takes in consideration the interest of the main stakeholders of the environments that we want to protect. But taking in consideration the interest of the stakeholders that we want to protect does not mean a libertarian non-interference view of their, in, of their interest. Quite the opposite. We need to give this, we need to provide these individuals with the proper conditions so that they can choose properly regarded, regarding their environment. One of the ways that, one of the things that need to be provided is that certain things are not up for grabs. Certain aspects of their social reality are not up for grabs. And I would argue that the most important aspect here is the fundamental right for education, especially the fundamental right for environmental education. And environmental education in this context needs to be seen in a Freirean perspective. What I mean by that is that those of us that are in the Philippines or that are in Brazil cannot share the same conception of environmental education in all its aspects with our friends in Canada or in Russia, because we have different environments. We have different territories with different needs, with different populations, with different kinds of, uh, of biological diversity, of zoological diversity that needs to be protected. And there is a further issue here, which is the interest of non-human animals. How do we include these interests in our environmental calculus? This is an extremely difficult situation, right? Uh, and it's one that I am not ready to answer right now, but I think that we need also to take in consideration. How do, we, how do we take in consideration the interest of non-human animals that can be impacted and that have an interest in sustainability and that however, whose interest might impact our own? So this is a very difficult issue. And I think one way that we can do this is by including other minds, other interests in the way that we discuss environmental practices in pedagogy. That is trying to bring up a, a, a richer view of the, let's say, animal world into play. Finally, Compensations are important. People need to be compensated by whichever losses they have when we introduce environmental practices. But compensations cannot be understood only from an economic perspective. The environmental itself and the preservation of the environment in itself can be seen as a compensation, but it will only be seen as a compensation by the stakeholders if they understand why the environment is compensating them. And in order for them to understand that, they need to have infrastructure. So none of this is going to happen in a void. So I guess that what, what I was trying to think through with you guys is a way of framing the discussion on sustainability. Ultimately, what I want to say is it's no use focusing only on compliance 
only on the ways that companies are acting towards the environment. We need to understand how governments and companies are acting and complying with international and local regulations in combination uh, with the consequences of these actions in the local environments and communities. Otherwise, we create a paradoxical effect in which very good policies that are very well designed are not going to be sustainable in the long run. So this was the main provocation that I wanted to bring to you. I hope that this brings some kind of light into these issues <clears throat> and that we can continue these discussions. Um, in my current uh, research, I would argue that freedom of speech also has a role here. And maybe we can talk some more about that later, but I think that I've spoken my 45 minutes. So, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I hope that this can be, be the beginning of many liaisons between our universities. I think that even though we are very distant geographically, we are so, so close demographically. Uh, our countries are so similar, our problems are so similar, and the way that theory affects us is so similar, and we really need to talk to each other uh, Really, because we have similar stakeholders and we have similar ways in which environmental protection and sustainability <clears throat> affects us. And I think it's about time that we talk among ourselves about these issues. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'm really curious to hear Banda and to hear all of you all about this. So thank you so much. Thank you, Fabricio, for that comprehensive lecture defining uh, different elements of the sustainability, also bringing in pedagogical approaches in such analysis. So uh, at this point, we now open the floor for uh, questions. You may raise your hands or type in a, your questions in the chat box. <clears throat> well, perhaps if I may try to break the ice with my own question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much Fabrizio for your presentation. I think you hit the nail right on the head as they say that where theory fails is in the real world, there are these uh, you know, human decision-making factors which come into play. Uh, and from what I know about Brazil and what is common with us in the Philippines, I think, uh, what are your thoughts on how to control or mitigate the effects of, um, let me use this word, the environmental freeloaders. Uh, for example, that means even if you were to get the majority of the indigenous population to be on board, there may be a small minority who would resort to criminal actions, poaching, for example, or even threatening those who are trying to protect the environment. Are there measures which are particularly effective or ones which are ineffective in controlling such actions? So thank you so much, Professor Raymond Tan. I think that you're absolutely right in putting the, the problem in this way. And uh, to be honest with you, we recently have a very poignant and sad uh, uh, example with this in the deep Amazon forest, right? With the two uh, environmental activists that were murdered. And that is a very complex story. And it's a very complex story uh, because it integrates many issues here. You bring up the issues of poachers, right? I, I I think myself I, I would I would frame poachers as victims of environmental practices uh, in many ways, because uh, they are in a situation in which they would need protection too. So that's why I brought up the example of the Tamar project. It would be very easy when you are designing uh, protection uh, uh, environmental protection for turtles in Brazil to frame turtle hunters as you know, uh, perpetuators of environmental violence, because in a way, of course, they are. Uh, but it would also be extremely insensitive, right? <laughs> uh, after all, these people are not there by any 
uh, let's say, complex way of thinking choice. Of course, of course, it is a choice to kill a, a turtle. Obviously, you're choosing to do it, but you're choosing to do it in a certain context. So I think that one of the reasons why this, this particular project has been so successful and has been so, I mean, it has been around for so long is because it was able to integrate former hunters as agents. And a converse and sad story about what happened in the deep Amazon uh, forest a couple of months ago is that I don't know if you are aware of that, but one of the killers, one of the perpetrators was a former trainee in an environmental program. They found photos of him when he was about 19 or 20 years old, and he was participating in a pilot project, which was discontinued. So there are real consequences when you discontinue this kind of project. Individuals turn back into the kind of community, into the kind of uh, practices that have been that have been proved in a very a very poignant way, but have been proved effective. And we can morally judge what they're doing for as long as we want. But ultimately, truth is we're not in the place where they are when they are making these decisions. So this is this is an issue here, right? I think that the main thing is, first of all, if if we need to criminalize poaching acts, we need to criminalize predatory hunting. Of course we do. But we also need to ask why are individuals that are indigenous to these areas adopting such strategies? Right, uh, and I think any policy that does not ask this question ultimately will fail. Uh, it may work for a while, but ultimately it will fail. And in order for it not to fail, unfortunately, if you are a libertarian, I'm sorry if you are a libertarian, but ultimately you will need public institutions. There, uh, 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 small or entrepreneur-like institutions will not be as effective in doing this, right? Because you need a long-term commitment and the kind of money and the kind of infrastructure that really the public is better suited to give in this kind of situation. So that would be a very tentative uh, answer to your question. But I think that you pointed such a poignant, such a, uh, a sad issue really, Right, and that we all see in our lives when we are in places like the Philippines and Brazil, which is the the very the very same stakeholders that you would expect to be involved in the preservations give up on preservation. Okay, so why does that happen? And what is the point that you will be able to say, okay, so right now we're going to punish you because really, you know, it, it's difficult. So yeah. Thank you, Fabricio, for that answer. Uh, we have a question in our chat box coming from Carmelita Kebenko. Allow me to read the, the question. So thank you, Professor Fabricio, for a very interesting and informative lecture. I agree with you that the education plays a very important role in the implementation of sustainability measures in communities. I wonder if education on sustainability began as early as in elementary schools where even young students can be developed to have habits that supports and complies with sustainability measures. Is this part of the education of children in Brazil? Well, uh, it is part of the system of education in Brazil formally. Formally, we are bound to talk about the environment. Um, so this is part of the curriculum. It is in the curriculum. And I think that many professors, many teachers, many tutors all over Brazil are doing an excellent job in implementing this. But then we will need to go back to Nusbo and ask how equalitarian is this? So this is the first problem. And the second, how context-based is it? Um, this is something that in the last years, I don't want to politicize this too much, but we've taken a big step back on this in the last years in Brazil. And I want to focus on policy, okay? Just in terms of policy, 
we've come from a system where this was very context-based and, and individuals were really um, encouraged to teach these this elements of the Brazilian environment based on the context to a more generalist view of these issues. And we're only beginning to understand the consequences of that, but I think that we'll see the consequences of that. So yeah, it is namely included in the curriculum, but in the last years, it has been deeply, deeply, let's say, relativized. So it's be, it's become quite relative, the way that people have become autonomous to, to talk about that in a negative way. It's a negative sort of autonomy, right? Because it's not protective autonomy. So it, it, again, Amartya Sen talks about that. Sometimes creating more autonomy can create less autonomy. This is a great example. Uh, you may uh, you, you you you've turned the policy more free, and in turning policy about environmental policy more free, you paradoxically made it less free. So th this is one of those effects, right? Yeah. I'm not sure this answers, but I did my best. <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, can I jump in? Sure. Uh, yep, yeah, thank you. I didn't raise my hand. I didn't see a hand raising icon. So, uh, but anyway, I have, um, I have a comment and a question. My comment is, uh, it sounds, your thesis sounds very, very sane and sounds really good. Uh, the issue is that I find, as, and I'm an engineer, and I've been an engineer my entire life. I tell people that uh, who ask, I said, I knew I wanted to be an engineer at like 12. It's just fortuitous that I had uh, the ability to, to follow that. We had a president who said repeatedly on many issues, we just have to get people plugged in and they'll be, uh, and what that came off as it came off as auto, autocratic and it sounded like, you know, perhaps it, it didn't make sense, but he was going to try to force people, even if it didn't make sense. And I think some of the, some of the issues would be, it has to really make sense in order to do these things, you know? So um, I can't, I got my uh, doctorate in uh, at Dartmouth and we had a center there on these things. It was a systems dynamics that, uh, um, a policy school, and uh, I still keep in touch with the director. Um, one of the directors has died, but one of them is, is still going, as far as I know. Um, in any event, um, I'm thinking that some of these things need to make sense, and the turtle um, uh, situation was a good one that 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 may have made sense from. It seems like people got behind it in any event. But I'll give you an example of, of what I mean, uh, and then I'll shut up. Um, you should never leave the mic open for a professor. So uh, you never know how long you're going to get get on that hook. But uh, in any event, we have a colleague uh, in Costa Rica, and she's um, the engineer at uh, La Salle in uh, Costa Rica, and she does source separation for uh, plastics. And I think that's, that's very uh, noble because um, most of the plastics are polyethylene based, not to get too technical, so don't, don't, uh, don't start yawning everybody. But uh, I think that, um, her, her, I don't think she'll mind me mentioning her name. She's Natalie Cruz. And she, uh, she has this source separation technology that seems to be and the kids get really interested in doing it and doing it correctly. So I think that's that's uh, sort of an interesting thing there. But there was also a, a technology that she, um, I think you, you like this short story, very short, that um, they, they communities get together and they, they form uh, little balls about the size of a tennis ball and they have inside of it, it's made out of local mud. And what they do is they also, they put it in, uh, put something called EM inside of it. EM means microorganisms. And the microorganisms, when they get into the river would tend to clarify the river. So anyway, 
so she um, has this community day and everybody lines up and the, the kids throw their, uh, their mud balls into the river to see if that would work. And I asked her, I said, well, it sounds really good. What if it doesn't work? And you know what her answer was? A very surprising answer. She said she didn't care. She said she thinks it's so important to get the community involved and, you know, behind something that, you know, other things will spin off from this thing right away. So, and I think that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, she got me involved. I don't know if that's good or bad. So, but she, uh, you know, she it was at the point where we, we could do something. Anyway, so I just wanted to thank you for your talk. Well, thank you so much, Gennaro. Um, I think that you, you you bring a very important point, and I think it adds up to something that I try to focus on: that compensation cannot be framed as only a monetary issue. Compensation can be framed from the standpoint of the community. So um, it's not because it's going to be just on one side, right? There are many ways in which you can be compensated. And I think that if people feel like they've been compensated, that this has built up their communities, that this has built up their lives, this has brought quality to their lives in ways that are really meaningful. Um, a professor Tatiana um, asked, uh, I, I saw the, the question here in the comments. I think that this has really um, uh, an important part of how uh, the central capability approaches can involve the environment. Right, uh, the use of the environment, the use of the river, the way that we relate to the river. So the river is not seen as a, a industrial waste point, right? It can be seen as a as a focal point for the community, where the community can grow up and build up. So I think that your examples are really rich in that sense, and thank you so much for that. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, I think that would be the last question for the webinar. And thank you, Fabricio, for answering also the question posted in YouTube. Uh, so with this, let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, let me just... Okay, since this is a uh, sustainability lecture series, our next would be September uh, to introduction of degraded lands in southern Brazil, the Restaura, Restaura Apa project, which would be delivered by Mauricio Pereira Almerao of the uh, La Salle University, Canals, Brazil. And before we officially end uh, this lecture, uh, may I request you to actually uh, go to this link for uh, the lecture evaluation uh, provided in this link. Okay, so with that, uh, we would now end uh, this session. And thank you so much for coming for this event. To our speaker, uh, Fabricio Pontin, thank you so much for giving us uh, a very comprehensive lecture on sustainability. So with this, uh, we end our session. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you Professor Fabricio. Thank you so much, you guys. Please yeah. keep in touch. You have my email. I'll be available whenever you need. And it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to speak with you guys. It's always a pleasure to feel part of this enormous community. So I'll be hoping to see you soon. Uh, I also need to fly away because I'm afraid that the parking lot here at the university is going to close. So 